I do want to just acknowledge again, you know, a heavy beginning and you may have thought there's not a lot here I know how to take uh, to the next to, to my leadership or my people but um, Tim and I were talking in our own breakout about how essential it is um, that we in this time of all times lead with and from lament um, it just would not be honest for us not to begin by acknowledging uh, everything we are all living through. Uh, and, and one of the unique things about this moment, as in many moments of great global upheaval is there's really no safe place. There's no place that's untouched by a sense of dereliction, by a kind of bitterness about what's been lost. Um, uh, even as there are the Bethlehems that, that seem especially precarious. So what do you need <laughs> when you are in a place like this? What do Mara, as she calls herself, and her Moabite daughter-in-law, Ruth, need? What do our cities need? What do our neighbors need? What do we need? I think the word is redemption. It's a very specific word um, with a very powerful core meaning. And it's what I want to talk about for the next 20 minutes or so. What is it? Uh, redemption is a word that is used a lot in Christian uh, ministry, uh, or at least we feel like it's a familiar sort of theological term. The interesting thing is it's actually originally not a term from the world of theology. Uh, it's not like, say, Trinity, which was a word made up to answer a theological question. The word redemption was already there in the language, in the culture, in the political and economic practices of the ancient world. And it's still present in its sort of non-theological commercial sense in our own time, because to redeem something or someone is originally to engage in an economic transaction that purchases uh, the freedom of something or someone that liberates it from some kind of indebtedness, bondage, or at the limit enslavement, if it's a person, um, some kind of loss uh, of freedom has happened. And to redeem is to pay to restore that thing or that person to, the, to, to their original condition, you could say. So we still use this today. Um, when we, uh, in, in the world of finance, you redeem a bond. A bond is an obligation to uh, pay a certain amount of interest in exchange for a loan. And the way you redeem a bond, uh, it, it, we sort of have turned it around. You often kind of hand it in to be redeemed and, and the, the issuer of the bond pays off the loan and now they have no more obligation. What redemption in its core is about freedom from indebtedness. In the ancient world, what would happen is people would have catastrophes, often multiple catastrophes that would lead to them having to pledge uh, their own land uh, to provide some cash. It could be a medical emergency. Uh, it could actually be as simple as being a relatively poor family and it's time to marry one of your uh, children, one of your daughters. And you'd have to sometimes in order to sort of put the dowry together, you'd have to pledge your land. But most often it was through things like what led to Elimelech and his family to leave Bethlehem, famine, loss of crops, uh, loss of a breadwinner, loss of the head of household. And of course, uh, at the extreme case, it wasn't just land that could end up in debt and uh, in bondage, you might say, but people. And uh, in the ancient world, people were in bondage, not usually because of the kind of slavery that we experienced for 400 years in the, in, uh, in the West, where people were enslaved on account of their uh, alleged race. Um, slavery in the ancient world was really an economic or a military um, outcome. Uh, you lost all your money and you couldn't pay. And so your creditors took your land rather than uh, your money, which you didn't have. Um, or they took your person, they took your labor, they took your freedom and you became enslaved because of debt. Um, and if you were enslaved or if your land was entailed in this way, uh, the only way to get it back and to get it free was for it to be redeemed. And so Naomi uh, needs a redeemer. <laughs> She needs someone, she has lost her ancestral land because it passed through the line of the man. It's no longer hers uh, to work. Uh, she's lost the economic, the ability to participate economically in the community. And she needs someone to step in and redeem. She is effectively uh, outside the circle of freedom, though she's not technically a slave in her case. 
um, and she needs someone to redeem her. And you can think of redemption more broadly as all the times when something has been lost and it needs to be restored through often a sacrificial act. At, in our work at Praxis, we have decided that what Christians are uniquely called to is redemptive life that this pattern of redemption, which started out as economic, and we'll get back to the kind of theological meaning of it uh, in a few minutes, that this is actually meant to be the pattern of our action in the world. We are sent to places of bondage, indebtedness, literal and metaphorical, lostness, places where something has been lost. And the mission of God is to send his people to the places where something's been lost and restore what's been lost. And the best kind of summary phrase we've come up with for how this plays itself out is creative restoration through sacrifice. Redemption is about creative restoration through sacrifice. So let me walk through uh, each of those words for a moment. Restoration. Uh, redemption, when it happens in our lives and in our, in, in our world, is is different from a couple of things. First, it's not just progress. So we could think, and I think our kind of secular technological world thinks that really most problems will be solved if we just make progress. Like how will we get out of this horrible COVID-19 thing? A vaccine, like medical progress. And we've had amazing medical progress and we are incredibly grateful for the speed with which the vaccines have been developed. And we have hopes that this year we're going to see real progress out past um, the most severe phase of this pandemic, right? But progress alone is not enough to restore because uh, for all the good that a vaccine will do and all the freedoms that we will regain uh, once we can be reasonably confident as we go about our business that we're not going to infect others or get infected ourselves. Is that going to restore the things we've lost in the past year? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I mean, I want that medical progress and I'm very grateful for it, but it doesn't restore. It doesn't restore what's been lost economically to people who've lost jobs it certainly can't possibly bring back those that we've lost to illness. It can't restore uh, even just the, the months of uh, lost learning of our children and children in our schools. So progress is not enough uh, for restoration. But the other thing restoration isn't, is it's not just about return to the past. Restoration is, I think in the biblical frame, uh, not just about rewinding to a time when things were better. I certainly, part of me wishes I could rewind. Um, I wish we could just go back to this time last year <laughs> and never have had it happened. And a lot of people, right, are kind of hoping that once the vaccine is in place, we'll just rewind to what 2019 felt like. For a, a host of reasons, it's not going to happen. And it wouldn't actually be best if it did happen. It's, uh, I, I, by the way, I think we will see a kind of a desperate attempt to reclaim what the past was like. Uh, the roaring 20s happened in the 1920s after the Great War was over, after the Spanish flu was over. And in some ways it felt to people like, you know, good times are here again. Um, but in fact, there were vulnerabilities before any of the cataclysms broke out that were not being addressed that if we just tried to rewind, those vulnerabilities would not be addressed. If we could somehow rewind before the killing of George Floyd, would that fix policing and the relation of police to communities of color in our country? Would that fix the history and legacy of white supremacy in our culture? It doesn't fix anything just to rewind because there isn't a place to re, there's not like a frame to rewind back to in the movie where everything was great. So restoration is going to have to be about something very different from just uh, returning to the past. And it's interesting just to go to a different part of the scripture for a moment. There's this interesting moment where we see a group of very early Christians kind of wishing for, uh, they, they think they know what restoring means. So it's in Acts after uh, Jesus' resurrection at the very beginning of Acts. 
um, Jesus is appearing to his disciples. And there's this one moment when they come together and they ask him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? This is what the disciples understandably think restoration is going to mean, that the Messiah is going to come, God's anointed, is going to kick out the Romans, restore the kingship, and we're going to go back to that Davidic era where righteous, a righteous king, Psalm 72, in his days, the, the poor will, will be provided for, justice will be done, the land will flourish. They think we, we're going to go back, right? And the fascinating thing Jesus says, first of all, it is not for you to know the times. In other words, I don't, I'm not going to tell you if it's the time. And in fact, in another place early, uh, he says, even the son doesn't know the time. He doesn't seem that concerned about exactly. Is this the time? Doesn't seem to be Jesus question. It's not for you to know the times or periods that the father is set by his own authority. And then he implicitly says also, and also you have no idea <laughs> what is about to happen, but it's not going to just be restoring the kingdom to Israel because you're going to receive power when the Holy spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You 11 uh, men at this moment and the 120 who are in that room um, and are in the room until the day of Pentecost, you have no idea the redemptive earthquake that's about to take place in history, whose aftershocks and effects are going to be felt to the ends of the earth. And you have no idea that by the end of the lives of these 11 in particular, the 11 apostles, uh, you are going to end, you yourselves, Thomas is going to die in India. James, some tradition says is going to die in Spain. Peter's going to die in Rome. Like you can't imagine what's about to happen. And, and then imagine if they could somehow see us. These, these men who <laughs> asked, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Will there be a righteous king in Jerusalem again? And they couldn't possibly imagine, uh, as I look around our little gallery here, that in this place they've never heard of called, uh, you know, Philadelphia, Lebanon, Allentown, Satterton, uh, Cherry Hill, uh, in this continent they don't even know exists, that there are going to be people who are now part of God's story. God has something so much bigger to do than just rewinding. I really believe this is for us right now. It would be, as we think about our own ministries after COVID, um, it would be so easy for us to just try to rewind to what it was like. And honestly, it's not going to happen. Many people who are with us in 20, late 2019 are not going to return. Many things that we could take for granted then are not going to be true now. And this, of course, was going to be true in Jerusalem as well. Jerusalem at this point is 30 years away from the thing that Jesus predicted, the, the final assault of the Romans in which not one stone would be left on another. And there are bigger cataclysms coming in our society and culture than we have yet experienced, I hate to say. And yet... God is acting redemptively and restoratively, and we are not ones who dream about just rewinding. We are God's chosen people to be part of creative restoration, not something you could just extrapolate from the past, but some new reality that will actually be full of redemptive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you are going to see a kind of creative infusion in the world that is not merely a return to some status quo. And that's good news for everyone who really wasn't doing very well under the previous status quo, but it's actually good news even for those who felt fairly comfortable because there's something so much more. So we're looking, when we think about redemption for creative restoration, new possibility, being brought into the world. And how does it happen? It happens through sacrifice. So I don't yet, I, I'm trying to work out why it has to be this way. <laughs> why, is sac why does it have to be through sacrifice? Why couldn't we just have creative restoration? I don't completely know yet. I, I feel like this is sort of some of the unfinished work, even theologically, to, to really understand what is it about sacrifice that unlocks uh, redemptive power, but I just believe and see in scripture and I see even in our own world and our own lives that this is the case. And so let me drill into that word sacrifice. What is sacrifice? Sacrifice is about loss. Sacrifice is about losing 
something that matters of value, but with a sacred horizon. This is the best way at least I've come up to describe it so far. Loss with a sacred horizon. That is, it's about losses that somehow come under the canopy within the reach of our of what we know of God and our relationship with God and God's providence and care. So sacrifice is loss that that we come to see as connected to our relationship with God rather than unconnected or or even a, a sort of denial of our relationship with God. And one word for the sacred horizon, I guess, is the word consecration. That is to make something sacred. To consecrate something is to actually declare this is sacred. And one pattern of sacrifice is maybe the most familiar. Certainly, it's kind of the biblical pattern when you think of the actual sacrifices that were prescribed to deal with sin and, and so forth um, in, in the Hebrew Bible. Consecration was to take something and, and make sort of declare it sacred. So you would take your firstborn animal and you would consecrate it to the Lord and then you would be willing to lose it, right? Having consecrated it to God, you would actually slaughter that animal who was the, you know, the firstborn, the healthiest, the normally would be used uh, to breed the next generation, to provide for the family. And instead that animal would be slaughtered as a way of saying, I'm willing to lose the most valuable uh, animal in my flock because I believe I live under the protective and providential care of God. And so I'm going to sacrifice this animal to stay in right relationship with God um, rather than use it for myself. So that's the pattern of consecration followed by loss. Uh, I might pause and, and just observe. I think many of us, especially those of us who have a vocation to ministry, uh, whether it's full-time or bivocational, this is in many ways what it is to have a call to ministry. You consecrate your life to God and you realize I'm giving, I'm leaving some things on the table. <laughs> I'm probably leaving a 401k. I don't know any pastor with a 401k. Maybe there are some. Uh, I'm leaving a certain kind of security on the table. I'm leaving a certain kind of status that I'll never maybe achieve. Certain levels of income, certain, lots of things, right? Uh, but I have come to believe my life is meant to be consecrated to God. And I'm willing to lose some things in order to pursue this call. It's not to say, of course, that uh, that, that, that loss is um, not outweighed in some ways by God's goodness. And we do it because we know God is good, but there is real loss. There's also another pattern that goes the other direction though. And I think it's important to name both directions. And that is that there are some losses that you would not choose that you would never choose, that you wouldn't be right to choose. And they happen anyway. You lose something or someone that you never would have wanted to lose. Uh, and our lives are full of these. Um, some of us have lost children. The Bible never commands us to <laughs> sacrifice our children, but some of us have lost our children, uh, whether to literal death or, or a breach in the relationship. Um, and what do we do with these losses that we never chose, never would have chosen, but that are defining realities in our lives? I do believe it is possible to consecrate those as well, to bring the things that we've lost within God's sacred horizon and say, I don't understand this. I don't, I might not even believe uh, it was best in any sense. The worst has come to pass, but I can consecrate it. I can tell you that as I've been driving, if it's five hours from where I live to my parents in Massachusetts. And as I, I, I'll tell you, I approach my parents' house and the sensation of loss is overwhelming as I know what I'm about to step into with my dad so diminished and my mother with her own very serious struggles in her eighties. And it takes everything I, in me to like drive that last couple miles uh, up to their home and step into caring for them in that active way. And uh, I never would have chosen this for my parents or for myself. And yet, what am I doing on those, on those last miles of the drive? I'm consecrating. <laughs> I'm saying, God, I don't feel adequate for this. I don't think I'm that good at this. 
but this is my moment to give this to you. I give it to you. I offer to you what all that is no longer and all that still is. And uh, just pray that you're present in it. And I'm making uh, the losses of my life into sacrifice. I think at a completely different level, a far more consequential level in some ways, just because it's such large scale and it goes to the heart of what's broken about our society, the, the, the gift in a way of the black church was that this is a people who never asked to come to this country. We're, we're abused, separated, lost everything, uh, mistreated, allegedly set free, then placed under structural conditions that were almost as bad as enslavement. And yet out of that came this Christian community that was able to take all that had been lost, all that they could rightfully cry out against God about, and yet bring it within a sacred horizon, consecrate it to God, treat it as a, a sacrifice that God would not overlook. Something redemptive happens when we bring our losses into God's uh, sacred presence. And I think you can do this. I'm running a little behind time here. I'm looking at my, my timer. Uh, so I'll have to speed up, won't I? Um, I think we can do this in a routine way, kind of on a daily basis. Uh, every day, offering our lives. This is Romans 12, right? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Every morning we get up and we say, God, whatever this day holds, including the things I wish it didn't hold, I offer them to you. And I also think there are moments of radical sacrifice that unlock new possibility in relationships and communities. Let me give you one more way of looking at this. And then in the last teaching section, we're gonna go back to the book of Ruth and look at how this played out. Uh, I hope this doesn't feel too abstract at this moment, but trust me, I think by the end of the third session, it comes together to some extent and gives us some, some beautiful pictures for what our lives can look like and what our paths for action can be. There's kind of three ways to go through life in a broken world. And I would call them the exploitative, the ethical, and the redemptive. One way of dealing with the losses of our world, the dangers of our world, the difficulties of our world is, to, is exploitation. It's basically to go through grabbing whatever you can get to protect yourself and people like you. And we know that a lot of people live this way. Um, there's a lot of businesses that are run this way. Uh, there's a lot of places you go and you sense as you walk in the door, I don't think this person is here for my benefit. I think they're here for their benefit. And I have to, you know, caveat emptor, be, beware, buyer beware. I have to really be on my guard because I'm in an exploitative place. Then there's a second way, which is better, definitely better. The ethical way in which people live not just for themselves, but hoping to serve others as well as benefit themselves in, in an appropriate way, live a good life, live by the rules, live in ways that they can be trusted, uh, that they aren't just uh, secretly grabbing what's best for them, but they're really trying to find ways to uh, serve their neighbors. And I actually think when a lot of Christians go into their daily life, not those who spend their days in full-time ministry, but those who go into all kinds of workplaces, a lot of us want to live ethically. And I think often the church kind of implicitly says, you know, this is, this is what it is to be a Christian business person, uh, live ethically. Uh, this is what it is to be a, you know, a good teacher, be, uh, live by the ethics of your profession. And if you do that, you'll be a Christian, you know, in, in your workplace. And, and by comparison with some of the other people we work with who are not even ethical, it, that's pretty good. But I think there's a third way. And I think it's actually the Christian calling, which is in every setting to not just go in to be ethical, but to be redemptive, to go in and be an agent of creative restoration through sacrifice. Let me give you maybe a picture of of how that might look in very simple terms. If you've ever encountered this thing called game theory that kind of looks at how people approach situations where there's something to be won and lost in a given environment, uh, there are these different models. So the exploitive way is kind of the win-lose model. 
Uh, I win, you lose. That's the exploitative game. I'm in this to get as much as I can. I don't care how much you lose in the process. And of course, this kind of exploitation is what leads to the uh, situation that needs redemption, right? It's it's when that creditor realizes they can get the land if they'll just call in the debt because they know the person can't pay. It's what happens when uh, Europeans discover vulnerable populations on the western coast of Africa and realize they can complete the triangle trade of uh, goods produced in the in the Americas and the Caribbean, uh, transport slave labor. It's hey, we win, you lose. The ethical way is uh, this very popular way called win-win. I win, you win. Uh, we find a mutually beneficial way to go through life. So what's the redemptive way? If ethical is win-win, is it I lose, you win? This is what we often think when we think sacrifice, right? We think, okay, does sacrifice mean I lay down, I'm a doormat, you get to exploit me, I lose, you win. Is that redemption? If so, it's going to be very difficult to convince anybody to do this. I don't think it actually is. I think here's what I think redemptive is. It's different. It's I sacrifice and we win. I sacrifice. That is, I am willing to lose something. I place something on the altar. I consecrate something and I'm willing to give it up. But as a result, we win. And the difference here is the other two games are about individuals. The other two games are about two individuals, one or both of them win, but at the end of the game, they walk away with their winnings. In the redemptive way, the sacrifice of one actually creates a we. It binds us together in a new way. It connects us to one another in a new way. And having my willingness to make that sacrifice, to offer up something to God, first of all, and also to make it vulnerable, to risk losing it, and perhaps to actually lose it, bind, binds us in such a way that we walk out connected to one another, able to win together, and we don't just walk away from one another, we now know and love one another. I think we caught a little glimpse of this in what you said, Glenn, about your breakfast this morning. Um, with your, your fellow pastor and leader. And in between the lines of what you said, I sensed that both of you probably, in order to have the level of trust that you had to take into that breakfast, both of you have had to sacrifice. Um, uh, just guessing in a way you've maybe had to lay down some of the privilege and insulation that comes with being white in our culture, the ability to kind of walk away from racial injustice and not pay attention to it. Your friend probably has had to sacrifice a certain kind of righteous outrage and distance that, that he could plausibly not want anything to do with some white church leader, uh, perhaps from the suburbs. And, and he's also consecrated that, right? And you have been bound together in a new kind of relationship because both of you, by the grace of God, have been able to approach it sacrificially. What I've come to believe is in the broken places of our world, these multiple catastrophe places, these places with systemic brokenness as well as individual brokenness, ethical is not enough. Just If we just operate ethically, that is, we play by the rules, we're fair, we don't cheat anybody, we don't exploit, we play win-win. If you play that way in Plymouth White Marsh School District, it does nothing to repair what's going on in that next school district that you that is your Bethlehem. It, ethical can't repair. Ethical maintains healthy systems, and it's great to be ethical in a healthy system. But what do you do when you're living in a broken system? What do you do when people are in bondage? Just being ethical doesn't repair it. Only redemptive repairs. So I am pretty conscious. I've given you a bunch of ideas and I haven't helped them land as much as I probably should have. They do land in the book of Ruth. We'll come back to that uh, in the third section here. Uh, but let's see if this is enough to start some conversation. Have you ever been in a situation, discussion question number one, where ethical was not enough to repair, where it, where it, just people continuing to play by the rules just wasn't going to get it done? Has there ever been a time when you saw the power of I sacrifice 
we win. Where somebody unilaterally even consecrated something, lost something, and it created something new in the relationship. This could happen in families. It can happen in companies. It can happen in churches. It can happen in cities. Have we ever seen it happen? And maybe a slightly different kind of question. What, what are the losses or the loss in your own life that you need to consecrate? The, the things you might never have chosen um, that you've lost, that you need to hold up to God and say, God, I give you this loss. I believe it's part of your sacred uh, work in my life. What, what do you need to consecrate that's been lost? 